Welcome to Chain of Learning. I'm Katie Anderson, your host and fellow learning enthusiast. This is Chain of Learning, where the links of leadership and learning unite. Today's guest is my good friend and colleague, Karen Martin, and I am so excited to have her on the show. Karen is the president and founder of TKMG Academy and the president of TKMG Inc., is the author of some amazing books, including The Outstanding Organization and Clarity First, and she has become a great friend and collaborator over the last handful of years. So I'm really excited to talk with Karen today and share a lot of the insights that we have both gathered over decades of helping organizations really become effective, high-performing learning organizations and helping their leaders and their change leaders do the same. So welcome to Chain of Learning, Karen. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Katie. It's just so much fun. And yeah, it's been quite a nice journey with our friendship and professional relationship and sharing ideas. It's just wonderful to always talk with you. Yeah, great. Well, I want to dive in. You and I had some good time uh, talking in advance about how we wanted to focus this episode. And we we aligned on a sort of a, a starting point that I think is really helpful, especially in following the last episode, episode nine of Chain of Learning, where I was talking about the really eight core competencies that change leaders need to become truly effective of not just uh, being technical process experts, but really being transformational change leaders. And I always talk about, and you always talk about, let's start with purpose. So let's start with the question, like, how do you define and how have you come to learn or discover what the real purpose of a transformational change leader is? Yeah, it's such an important question, isn't it? It, mm. purpose, you know, it, it, it directs everything. It's, it's, you know, how we learn, it's how we behave, it's how we think. And to me, anyone that's involved with transformation, whether a full-time improvement professional or a leader that just has a real interest in and, and passion for improvement and transformation of, of any sort, it's about being a teacher and paying it forward and coaching and, and drawing it out of people so that they become higher potential. They are the ones that are higher performing. And I think all too often people think that, you know, especially people that are full-time improvement professionals think that they should be the experts in doing and, and, and doing for others is a common thing I see. And that's not really what I believe our role in, you know, the improvement community for sure is. And same with a leader. A leader is not, their role is not to do for their employees it's it's or team members uh, it's to help them develop and and learn and, and become you know a higher version of themselves and a, and a more fulfilled version of themselves absolutely and this you know this is where we have to pair our technical knowledge regardless if it's some you know uh, being an operational excellence practitioner or our technical knowledge that we've developed in our industry or our field and we've been promoted for when we step into that uh, people leadership role, either as a coach or as an actual manager or leader, our role shifts, as you said, to about paying it forward. And this is really that core concept of a chain of learning. How do you pay it forward and and keep helping other people learn to grow and improve as well? What yeah. are some? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> I was going to say, what are some of the? You know, you work with so many organizations around the globe for decades. And what are you seeing as some of the challenges that change leaders have in really effectively, I guess, balancing this, you know, have, applying their expertise, because we all have expertise, but really creating a sustainable learning organization that's going to like be there when they uh, move on? I think one thing is, you know, do the leaders above them in the organization view that as their role? You know, a lot of times we'll hear people get stuck into improvement professionals, especially get stuck in this place where the leader wants them to go and do for the mm. team and, and go and do for the middle managers. And and so if leaders are expecting that, then it's going to be tough for that person to really navigate out of that and and put the teacher hat on and the developer hat on. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is, is that you have to love teaching. You have to love helping people develop. And if you, you know, want to hoard the information and keep it to yourself and mm. become a doer, that's really not what I view the role of, of an improvement professional to be. And again, middle managers as well and director level and vice presidents and all of that. So I think that the environment needs to encourage that in the mm. first place. 
place in order for it to have a chance of emerging. Yeah, I hear two things in, in what you just said in particular that stand out and resonate with sort of what I have experienced personally and observed in organizations is one, leaders or executives sort of wanting to hire a group of expert problem solvers as their, you know, continuous improvement, lean team, and the, just doing the doing and executing. And so that's even defining or the challenge and even contracting for what your role is. And then two, many people in those roles also not personally seeing that to really step into their influence and their true potential to be transformational change leaders, it's not just them being the expert and doing the doing. They they also personally have to go through that transformation themselves. So it's like on two levels, what's the expectation from the executive team? And then what is how are they defining and shaping their true um, impact and role as well? Right. And, and there's actually a third prong too. I mean, someone in that role has to be pretty darn knowledgeable about the plethora of practices and principles and tools and methods and analysis, analyses, you know, that you can do in order to do that work. Yes. And so it's important for someone to, first of all, always learn, you know, never stop learning um, and always understand that no matter where you get your knowledge from, there's always more to be had and more to be gained. And so that appetite for learning and developing and also seek mentors, you know, seek people that will help you develop and, and help apply content that you're reading about or watching or whatever it might be in the real world so that you get stronger. So it's, I think, you know, I always say with confidence comes competence mm. and you have to be knowledgeable to be confident and then to, you know, behave in a very competent manner. So it, appetite for learning is really critical. Absolutely. And it's both the appetite for learning and really grasping the technical side and the appetite for learning and practicing those social competencies that we've talked about. And that I also go through um, in the last episode in my Catalyst Change mo Leader model, which it, we have to have both. We have to be great at executing on the work. And we also have to be great at creating those influence and the human dimension skills and the, the coaching and the teaching and all of that as well to truly be effective. Yeah. And this gets into, we, we talked a little yeah. bit about facilitator development and how, mm. does, how does one, you know, wearing an improvement facilitator hat become the best darn facilitator that ever existed. And it's, you know, it's having the knowledge to pass on. Mm. That's important. But then it's also, knowing the right way to pass it on. So, you know, for example, if you're in, um, let's say that there's some kind of value stream mapping going on, you know, and let's say that I see very clearly a future state design idea that would very likely help a lot in with performance. You know, the last thing I'm going to do is say, have you ever considered blah, blah, blah? You know, I, I, you know that's not what my job is initially. Initially, my job is to try to see if they can see it. Do they see it? You know, ask questions to get them seeing what you see. And then, it, you know, if you've really done a good job of asking and they're still not getting it, then you have to assess, do they maybe not even know about what that is? And then put on truly a teacher's hat and say, let me show you something that may work here, you know, and introduce it to them that way. Absolutely. I mean, you touched on sort of two, two of the skills, you know, the, a skillful facilitator and being this transformational coaching leader. One, for it being a skillful facilitator, how are you guiding people through uh, a process of learning and getting to the outcomes? And then being a transformational coach is not, it's, it's important to learn how to ask better questions and, and exactly what you said. How do we start with understanding where their current, you know, their current understanding is? Do they know or not know? And if they don't know, then how do we move into that teaching role? And I've seen, and you've talked about this before too, that a lot of times people start learning how to ask questions and then they see coaching as only right. asking questions, but there's actually a lot of other dimensions around that. How do we walk alongside people? How do we give feedback? How do we teach? So we go, before we go too much, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, in, I think it was in the outstanding organization, I defined coaching as reflective coaching and directive coaching. Mm. And to me, reflective coaching is you're asking questions to get the person to reflect on what they likely already know. But then if you discover that they really don't know how to do something, then you move into directive coaching and at least, you know, teach them something that, uh, of, practice or a tool or something that they can try and see if that's the, you know, the ticket for getting to the next step in whatever their, whatever problem they're solving. Uh, 
Totally. And if you stay in that reflective coaching mode and people are really stuck and don't know how, then you stop being really helpful. That's like super frustrating for the other person, right? Um, so it's the art. Yeah, it's rude, right? They are in the root in, in the con- totally in the converse. The converse is true too that we often make the assumption people need us to teach them when actually, if we held some space for ask some questions, they might get to the they may have actually have that capability inside them. They just needed some good probing questions to get there. So we can't make assumptions on where people's skill or ability or in that moment is at. Uh, it, it's being flexible and meeting them where they're at. Well, let, let's come back to the concept of facilitation later, because I think there's some really great um, things we can explore about how uh, people in these continuous improvement facilitator roles can even get better at that. But I want to go back to another question as you know, you've had over your years of uh, experience. If you were to look back or you are, I'm asking you to look back on your career and what you have learned, what advice would you give to your younger self? to, I guess, more effectively get to your discoveries faster? Yes. Good one. Good question. So I do think that there are many. Uh, One is I don't think I ever truly appreciated, and I certainly didn't appreciate it early enough, the importance of understanding how business actually works. Mm. You know, the inner, the inner workings, You know, I was fortunate that I got to move around a lot in an operation. So I got to be on a sales team. I got to be in the marketing area. I actually got to be in the legal team. And, you know, I asked for those roles. And so getting to really understand business and and how it works is important, including and especially the financial uh, aspects. You know, how does money actually flow? Does it flow? You know, where's the money coming in for the organization and even a nonprofit? You know, you've got to know where the money's coming in and you have to have enough money to pay for expenses and hopefully more than that so you can reinvest in the organization. So understanding business was something that I just didn't, you know, I started out as a scientist and so business wasn't even you know, something I was gravitating toward. And now I'm obsessed with business. And so it's interesting how that transition, once I started learning about business, I was like, oh, this is really fun. You know, I like this. And um, so I think that's one thing. Uh, Yeah, before you move on, I mean, I think that's so true. I mean, I came from academia. I was an academic researcher. And, you know, I think it's interesting. I run my own business now. But I I realized I had a similar realization that to be effective once I'd moved into consulting roles, that I had to understand more of like (laughs) the business aspects. How have has been able to speak the language of business or be what I call a knowledgeable business um, expert? help you in an internal or external consulting role and speaking that language that that executives you know understand like they need business results so how how has that been helpful for you and why is that some advice you'd give for your younger self instant credibility you know when you're able to speak someone's language and use terminology in the correct way that they're using and be able to under you know demonstrate that you understand the pressures, for example, and those types of things, you know, it's, it's just instant credibility. And when you get instant credibility, then someone's going to give you a little more yeah. you know, latitude to do more. So then you can grow more as a professional and it, it becomes this, you know, really lovely feeding machine. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's critical. And you know, I think you just start by going in and talking to executives, asking for meetings, asking them questions about the business, asking them what the financial pressures are, asking them how revenue is actually brought into the organization. Most people don't even know where all the, the variety of revenue streams coming into an organization. And so like those seek, 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 seek. Yes. And you've shared with me like you're one of the executives you worked with gave you a book and said, read this. And you're like, whoa, it opened your eyes. And yeah, yeah, fill the gaps and the knowledge and the skills that you have across these different dimensions so that you can step into that full potential and and grow, not just in the small area of expertise you have initially, but, but broader. Well, yeah. And, and if I can add, it's not just me, you know, I, I was really excited to learn all this. And, you know, I felt like it really opened my eyes to how improvement, you know, really does help business. But I was uh, in a Starbucks and there were these two young women sitting at a table and they were all like very excited and I couldn't really hear them. I was over, you know, ordering my coffee. But then the barista, you know, the place where you stand to get your coffee was right near where they were sitting. And so I was kind of like eavesdropping a little bit and listening in. And the one woman was relaying this uh, situation where she was 
I don't know if the CFO invited her in or what, how it happened, but somehow she got into a conversation with the CFO, chief financial officer at her company. And she was explaining to the other woman, you know, I learned so much about how the money comes in and what the, and I didn't even know what revenue meant. And I didn't know what difference, what, what sales was versus revenue mm -hmm. and pre-tax and post-tax. And she was so excited. And, you know, I think the more you know, you know, the more you you do get excited about the world that we're in. It's 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 a complex world, but it's fun. It is, and you know, as you're talking, it, it, it sparked another thought in my in my mind too. It's not that as you know, any of us have to become full experts in all areas of the business, but if you're going to be coaching executives uh, at any or, or leaders at any level. And that's, it doesn't matter if you're in a role called coach or if you're working together as, you know, a management team to be able to ask those provocative questions that relate to the business. So you have some understanding so that it helps other, maybe helps them think in a different way. So you're not taking over again. You're not always just telling them what to do, but you're asking those provocative questions because you have a baseline understanding of how business works and the yeah. results that matter um, is a super important skill as you get, especially as you get more senior in working with more executive levels, you know, as a coach or an external consultant as well. Yeah. And, you know, you need to uh, seek out facilitation opportunities in various parts of the company, mm. because when you're facilitating, you're learning a lot about processes and the environment and things like that. And I'll never forget the first time I facilitated a product development team. And I was scared to death because I had done product development on the health insurance side of things. But this was a manufacturing product. And I, I was very nervous. And one of the things I learned or I, or I thought I learned and I was like, mm, I'm not sure about this. Let's see. Was that there's a propensity in some organizations when there's technical capability to engineer something, there's a propensity in some organizations to build it and then fling it into the marketing area and hope that they hmm. in the sales area and hope that they can sell it. And um, and I thought eh, that can't be that, that this must be just this organization. And I saw it over and over and over to where it's now a pattern that I see where there are a lot of products being developed that they really haven't tested to see if the market has any appetite for it. And it's like, wow, that's a lot of money and a lot of time, you know, to get a product out there that ultimately very mm. often pops. And so, but that's, you know, knowing that and knowing that that's a, a propensity, then as a facilitator, you can start kind of poking a little bit and, and getting and, and asking better questions that get people focused in a little more on, well, should we really be doing this? You know, that type of thing. Absolutely. And also because of the unique role uh, and nature of the role of working across the organization, I think we start to see the systems connections outside of maybe functional silos that maybe leaders sometimes unintentionally get get trapped in. Like I'm a finance person, so I'm looking here or I'm looking at this segment of operations, but you start to see everything. So how can you help the leaders make those connections and, and pose those questions too, so that they're being, they're the kind of more eyes wide open on the, the impact of the whole system. Yeah. And that's where value stream thinking and value stream mapping and value stream, you know, everything um, is really helpful in making and helping leaders make those connections. Because, you know, the one thing about value streams is we find that there's hardly ever one leader in an organization that can describe with any level of accuracy how they actually deliver value to a customer. The mm. actual, you know, steps that the work goes flows through from some sort of request to delivering on that request. And when you've got not one leader who can explain that even, you know, really high level, that's a problem. Imagine the decisions that are being made, be at, you know, with that lack, you know, that they don't understand that. So, you know, that's, you know, the more you can do value stream work, also the more knowledgeable you yep. can become about all the different pieces that go together to make a company soar or not. Absolutely. And for our listeners who maybe don't know what value stream mapping is, how would you, I guess, have a quick summary of the difference of value stream mapping versus, say, looking at a process map that maybe people are more familiar with? Yeah. So value streams are a holistic work system at a high level where work is being passed through many, many different parts of an organization. And there's, you know, enterprise wide value streams and then there are smaller value streams. And there are also customer facing value streams and internal facing value streams like the hiring process, for example, hiring value stream. Um, so it's this, it's looking at the flow of work through all these handoffs. They tend to be longer in duration mm -hmm. and they tend to have more hands in the pot. Yeah. in a process is. 
And you need process level you know, views yeah, to look at for your you know, document standard work, for example, but you need value stream views in order to prioritize what needs to happen across the entire work stream, the, the whole system yep. to get work to flow more easily. Absolutely. So also the interconnection of information flow and material flow and all through creating value for a customer on like one particular product or service. So it's just a different way of actually seeing that system level interconnection. Right. Um, so again, you know, we're talking about, so you need to have that technical side of how do you do these things, but then the social competencies of how to communicate that information and, and get people to see and get bought into the different elements of how that that might work. Mm -hmm. That when we were reflecting uh, for you earlier, Karen, you shared sort of two key areas that were that were sort of that you'd recommend to yourself. That first was really understand like the the business, speak the language of the business, understand the financials and those drivers for executives. And then you said another, um, which is really around the people system, like psychology and behaviors. So speak to me more about what would you recommend or share with your younger self about why that's so critical to really becoming an effective leader or change leader? You know, it's, I think we fight human nature a lot and it, and it doesn't serve anyone well. Um, you know, if we fight how people are wired, we fight, you know, how people have a soul and a heart and, um, and we often actually, um, criticize people and blame people when they have, for example, resistance to an idea. You know, resistance is a great opportunity to find out what's really going on psychologically, what's going on. I'm not, you know, saying we have to have PhD in psychology or anything like that. It's, it's just, you know, being present and sensing what's going on and then asking questions about mm -hmm. that to find out why someone's resisting. And most of the time when you probe, you'll find out they're right. There is something wrong with what's going on that maybe no one else is articulating. Mm. Maybe, maybe if someone's a complainer, they're not very effective in, in dealing with what they see, but it doesn't mean they aren't right at what they see. Mm. And um, I find that a lot that, that someone who's a complainer and a resistor is often onto something. And so I am I like, when I hear someone is not going to be a good team player because they're you know always resistant or always complaining, I'm like, bring them on. Bring I want them on the team, on the team now. <laughs> well, right. And that highlight, highlighting, you know, the things that maybe people, other people aren't seeing. And also if you get that person bring them along the journey and then they're really bought in because they played a role in creating the solution or the the next steps, they are going to be a much bigger champion. Huge. And, and as you said too, like, I, I always think like there's a, there's some reason if I hate, I don't like calling people resistors, like there, there, there's a reason there's something going on why this change isn't feeling good. And so being able to understand that change process for people is a really important skill in being able to influence change and bring people along and, and the whole process on, on that as well. So yeah, I mean, sometimes people resist change because what they have seen is change isn't an improvement. It's just no. change, you know, yeah. and, and that, that's not very helpful to have just change, you know? So, uh, so again, back to this, they're often right. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. So it's right. It's these, these human skills that we have to pair with our technical skills and we definitely need both to really, to be effective. Yeah. One of the things you and I talked about is that we can't forget though, you know, as operational excellence practitioners and enthusiasts about at the end of the day, businesses and their leaders need and want to get results. And yeah. so we often like we we want to we see developing people as the way to get results, but sometimes we either just focus on the results or focusing just on developing people. What? How do you think about this? Uh, this I guess this balance or tension between getting results and developing people. It's about getting results, but. You can't get consistently good results if you're not developing your people. You won't attract top talent. You won't retain top talent. You know, you, in order to build this high performing workforce, you have to have the, the environment for people that are top performers to want to be in. <laughs> and so, so it's, it is about getting results. It's about delivering value to customers. I mean, that, that's what I saw this on LinkedIn over the weekend. Lean is about developing people. No, it's not. That's one element toward getting results. Mm. It's, it's about getting results and delivering value to customers. And people development is the means to that end. 
and, um, and building strong problem solving capabilities and all those things that make people come into work buzzing with excitement because they're there and buzzing when they leave because of these great days they had, you know, applying what they learn and, and learning more, you know, that that's, there's no reason not to have that. I mean, that that is absolutely doable. And, and then it becomes a win-win-win for employees, customers, and shareholders. And leaders can sleep at night too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And we all want to work in, a, in an environment that feels good, but we need to be aligned in what we're trying to achieve. And, and ideally, the results are driven, as we know, about value as defined by the customer uh, as well. You know, Toyota's model, one of their motto uh, is we make people so that we make cars or we make people while we make cars. It's like the focus is we make people, but it's the result so that we can deliver the results that we need for our customers. And so we can't forget either side of those equa that equation. Um, and we can't just focus on results like so myopically that we forget about people as well. So right. we kind of have mean, to. Yeah, that, that's a horrible place. That's a horrible environment. I don't want to work in that environment. When no. it's about results and no one, no one cares about developing me. You know, that's that's horrible. So, yeah, it's. But it, I, I think, you know, the chicken and the egg is important to keep in mind here that, that you know, developing the people comes before you can actually create the thing that you're actually trying to go after. Exactly. So know where you need to go and focus on developing the people and you will more effectively get to there or achieve the thing that you need to do. Right. In parallel at the same yes, time. Yes, yes, yes. It will, so it's like... Develop the people through the work. That's exactly. Exactly. You know, I talk about how the advice that Mr. Asao Yoshino gave me, and this is in my book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, a leader's role is to set the direction, like what are the results we need or the, the things we need to achieve, and then provide support, which is developing people so that they can get there, and then develop yourself as well, which is, you've talked about, is the importance of being a lifelong learner. Right. I want to shift into you and I uh, of talking about continuous improvement, change teams, uh, not just the executive leader too, but how we've worked, both of us, with a lot of different organizations, different industries around the world and have different configurations of how people are setting up uh, building internal capability for leading improvement. And I'm curious, what are some of the things that you have been observing recently that have been effective? And what are some of the gaps that you're starting to see in how change is happening or these like these lean or continuous improvement cultures are being led um, internally? Whew, that's a big I, know, question. I know where to start. <laughs> that's a big question. Well, so let's talk about some of the things that I find aren't effective first. Um, I don't think it's effective to, you know, put people into a certificate program uh, with a project and have them come out and expect them to be able to perform at high levels. And I think the there's been, you know, decades of that being some sort of model for developing people. You know, you put them in, you know, some sort of a program, whether it's a belt program or another program. And by the way, we used to offer a lean certificate program that we delivered on site. And I quickly stopped it uh, mm. when I saw that, you know, 24 people in a classroom you know, six months later, weren't applying any of it because the organization wasn't ready for it. They mm -hmm. didn't have the infrastructure and the environment and leaders weren't engaged and all kinds of reasons why those people didn't, you know, really get to apply what they were learning. And so, you know, knowledge is, is the first step for sure. Um, but applications, when you start really building your, your skill set. And then the other thing that was happening or is happening still is, people go through a program and they get like this much of what you need to know to be effective. And that doesn't negate that, that that's a good start, but a lot of people stop and a lot of organizations think that's it. And, um, and then leaders wonder why the people aren't able to perform and then they start kind of sort of blaming the team. And then, you know, we're seeing actually a fair amount. And you and I've talked about this. There's shockingly high numbers of improvement professionals being laid off right now. Yeah. And, you know, when people are laid off, it's generally because leaders aren't seeing the value. And, um, and it's not that the people don't have value. It's that there, there's a variety of reasons why they're not able to provide the value that would otherwise keep them employed. Yes, I mean, that, that is, a, I, I've observed the same thing. And I think there's a, like a false sense of 
how much skill has been developed through a introductory sort of belt type of program. And it's not teaching with all the other influence skills you need to really keep, you know, both the technical skills and those social competencies to grow um, and really be leading, um, leading change. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're still dealing with the, the long path uh, when lean, you know, became popularized in the United States, it was through the prism of tools, you know, and, and that big, I mean, everyone gravitated to that. And, and I mean, when you look at the indexes of some of the early lean books, there weren't even words like leadership culture, <laughs> you know, like that, those words weren't even in the index. And so, you know, I think we're still like, we're, we're getting better, you know, the problem solving movement with the A3 books that came out in the Encada and with um, the understanding that leadership, you know, development is the big part of it and culture is a big part of it. And we're getting there, but it's still, we're still, I think, dealing with the, the beginning days where it was about technical capabilities and not that social. What's Jeffrey like recall with the social, um, Oh, he has a great term for it. Um, oh, darn it. I can't think of the term that he uses. That's like the, the social aspect of, of what we do. Darn it. Is it the socio-technical system? Or... Yes, that's it. Oh, system. socio-technical you, system. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I love that term. It's such a great, it's so apt. You know, it's, it's the perfect term to describe what it is that we're building. Right. So you, and it speaks to what we've been talking about here today. It, you need the technical side and the social side together, which are going to help you achieve results by developing, b- right. de- developing people. Yeah. Something else you and I have talked about, uh, and I think this goes, I know this goes back to sort of how uh, some of the challenges and how lean and continuous improvement was being introduced, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And certainly it was my experience of doing a lot of Kaizen or rapid process improvement workshops. So one day, sorry, not one day, one week workshops where a consultant would come in and either train the internal team or lead this, bring in a you know multidisciplinary team together to work on a problem and then they have output. And that was certainly how I was trained and developed. And we saw some gaps in that because then like there was no follow up <laughs> there, you know, there was no coaching and follow up, but it also had some benefits that maybe with, you know, I feel like there's been a pivot away in many organizations from doing, uh, sort of extended day uh, improvement events as well and seeing some gaps in, cause that was also a, a training opportunity, a learning opportunity for internal facilitators. What have you been observing around that? And I can share some, some thoughts as well. Yeah. So Mike Westerling and I wrote the Kaizen at Planner. It was published in 2007. I remember uh, getting that when I was learning. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm glad we helped you. In, yes. In way. Um, the you know the the problem with kaizen events as you've articulated is that it's it's like this i i almost call it a fake universe and and what i mean by that is it's not real the real work day you know people are sequestered they're focused there aren't interruptions you know if you if you run them the right way and but yet you're able to get a lot done because of that then what would happen with kaizen events is people go back into the regular work environment and they didn't have that environment and then they just got sucked into the dysfunction of organizations and weren't able to apply what they learned so it was almost worse than not exposing them to that excitement and euphoria at all because then they get really deflated going back into the the regular world so you know the way to use Kaizen events effectively is to make sure it's running in parallel of developing yes. the, you know, the organization so that people are able to start getting better and better at making improvement part of the daily work and not require a five-day Kaizen. Remember, five-day Kaizen events were developed by consultants. Yes, it was easy. <laughs> Come in for the week. <laughs> yeah. Fly in, fly out, five days. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that there's not tremendous value. Now, we don't do five days anymore. It's just a little too much for most. We usually do three to four. But... We are starting to do more now. We also stopped doing them for a while. Um, not entirely, but very limited. But we're starting to do more now because we're able to work with organizations in getting the, the whole vibe of the organization ready to support that kind of work. And they're still the best thing I've ever experienced in all my years of, of business for getting people to sit down together and look at a process cross-functionally, understand each other's worlds, yes. understand the decisions that they've been making that have been very adverse to the people downstream or upstream that are you know in the system. And it, there, there's just nothing like it. 
to achieving some of those types of, of benefits. So, Absolutely. It's good. I, I, I completely agree with you that if, if you have these offline, as I say, like, like events, you can get a lot of improvement and they, so much excitement. But if you don't also have the development of the management systems and coaching for people on how to, how to implement and sustain and continuously improve, it's going to fail. So you have to have these in parallel. But I also see pivoting away. And a lot of my clients and uh, other organizations that I work with have been telling me they've almost completely moved away from doing any kind of focused improvement uh, work. So that offline, it's like just a few hours, maybe here or there. And I feel I feel like there's a few things missing. One, that energy of coming together as a team, of having that focused time. If you really want innovation, you, sometimes you need that focused time outside of the work, um, that engagement. And also as a development opportunity for your internal change team and facilitators. If I, if I think back to my own pathway, I was paired at first with, and I was really lucky. So I was one of the sort of fire starters for lean at the hospital system I was working at. And so I was chosen as the first internal, uh, facilitator, or, you know, coach to be trained, uh, which is like a blessing in my, in my own career. But I was paired and it was a series. It was like five workshops. First, it was observe one and then work in partnership. Um, and then, you know, uh, the last one was observation. And I was in, in, in parallel with me, them teaching me the technical side about how I look at process and then how I, you know, I'm looking at all that. I was learning how to work a room, how to create a project charter, how to do all that facilitation and influence and all of those social competencies. Right. And a lot of the organizations I work with now, I don't, some of their executive leaders are saying they don't have that. And like, so people are coming in and still just trying to do their best work, which is great. And I was, you know, I totally understand that, but we're missing like a development opportunity for those social capabilities that are really going to create transformational change leaders right. and move just from that technical side to uh, leading change. So I, I, I'm curious on, you know, for those of you listening, what, what's going on in your organizations and how, you know, what are the, what are the challenges and things that you're being help enablers for really creating internal capability for people in change leadership roles and for managers and, and executives too, to lead these change? Well, there's a practical side of it as well that I think is important to acknowledge is that, you know, when you have people that are getting together periodically to work on a problem or make some sort of improvement, there's, you know, that whole ra mental ramp up period that you have to go through in order to get your head back where you where the team was whenever you met the first time or the previous time. And that is a form of task switching. And so you lose all that momentum that you get in a Kaizen event or a rapid improvement event because you're moving from day to day and you're still focused on the same thing. And so it takes so much longer to get results. Yep. So you're missing out on the development to your point. You're, you're not getting as good a results. It's taking too long, you know, and it's just, it's just, yep. you know, there's, there's a time and a place for these kinds of multi-day focused improvement. And it's right. an important important technique. Absolutely. So I'm not advocating for like going back and just only running Kaizen events, but I, I, I would like us all to consider like where, where can doing some of that offline focused work be an enabler for, for learning and change and seeing it as a development pathway for people as well. So that you're like partnering and, and developing those skills. Yeah. You know, I just had a situation with a prospective client where, you know, we were talking about value stream mapping and it was, you know, a very big value stream. So it absolutely took at least three days, if not four, it would have to do it. And they just were like, we can't give that time. And I you know, tried to get them to see that they're already spending that time times 100 because of the problems in the value stream that they deal with day in and day out that are recurring, that aren't going away. And that they're, you know, they're spending well more than three days worth of time over and over and over with the systems problems that they've got. And um, I, but I was unsuccessful. Mm. And so they said, you know, basically they wanted to you know, meet once a week for a period of time and fly me in once a week and all that stuff. And I said, not only will I not do it just logistically, but it's not the right way for you to take a look at your value stream. It's just not, you, you're, you're not going to gain from this work the way you would if we just spent three days together. Yeah. So. And, and what you just shared too, is an important skill for all of us to learn too, is like, how do you 
speak to leaders to be able to say this, you know, I'm also a trusted advisor and this is not the right way and have that influence to say, not just go and do it because that's what someone wants, but like, I'm also in an advisory role where I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my expertise on how to do this. Yeah. And it's a hard call when you're internal, you know, it's, mm. a, it's a, a harder, I guess I should say, call when you're internal because, you know, it's people always are afraid that they're going to be known as the difficult person or, you know, whatever it might be. But, you know, if you're being judged on results and you are, <laughs> you know, then you need to get results, you know, so that you can be judged in a really good way. Um, and so you have to be able to lobby, advocate, you know, whatever it is for the right you know, combination of people and days and focus and, you know, what the charter is and metrics and all that stuff. You have to be able to advocate for that. Absolutely. I want to just put in one comment around the Kaizen events and follow up what you just said, because it reminded me of something you shared recently with me. Uh, But on the Kaizen events, I, I think it's really interesting. GE with Larry Culp's leadership has talked a lot about how they've really been focusing on the strategy of having these focused improvement events as a way to teach people the skills. And then, of course, you need the follow up and coaching. Um, and I talked about this with some of their executive transformational leaders in my um, episode five around, or actually, sorry, episode six inside the lead mindset. And, and I just, it's been a lot in the, in the papers recently about GE's turnaround and how they've been using lean to do this and how important having some focused improvement events has been. Not the only strategy, but at really seeing it as a way to bring people together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Karen, you you just shared something that was really important uh, too about how you need to get results, as in, especially as an internal person, and you're judged on those results. And you may know that developing people and all these other things, which is on part of your vision, you know what's possible um, for true organizational transformation. But maybe your executives, you know, like I got to get those operational results. Uh, how? you know, what have you learned about how to sort of sneak in the things that you know are the most important while still delivering those results? Um, so I'm used to doing things through the side door. As I say, you know, I, I had a period in my early career where I was uh, overseeing wellness programs and try selling that to executives. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, well, we don't know that that actually does anything to, to prevent a heart attack, <laughs> you know, and those kinds of things. And so at least we're in a little bit easier model here where you can tie cause and effect with results. So, um, so I'm always, always weaving in psychology, you know, in every, every step of the way, even putting a charter together, forming the team deciding how aggressively to go for the results. Is it better to do low hanging fruit? Is it better to go for something very difficult? Is it like, there's just all of that, you know, how ready is the organization for whatever it is? How ready is the team to do whatever Mm -hmm. it is? And, and just, you know, starting to get more and more clear about that um, is a way to get better results um, by being, you know, by having that kind of, um, that that psychology bent is that is that what you're asking? I'm not sure. I'm yeah, well, you shared an example recently um, of you know a client that you'd worked with that where you know the leader was like, "Yeah, man, I I just need these results and need them fast." Oh. And and <laughs> but you're like, "Oh, okay, I got to work on that." So I got to speak the language that the executive needs. But you knew that also the way to get there was was to do these other things. But you're gonna like. Yeah, so I, it's just a, I think it's a really important skill that yeah. like you see this vision for what's actually needed, but the, also there's the, there's the, like the thing right in front of them that they need, but the bigger thing is actually going to be what's going to achieve the greater yeah. success. So how, you know, how, how did you approach that situation and, or this one or in the past? Well, so as an outsider, that particular situation, I was able to quickly help him see that if you know, we just go and do it and just jam results out of a team, that that's not going to build any skill sets amongst the team. And that what, what actually is better is building the skill sets as we're going. It may take a little bit longer, just a little bit, not a lot, a little bit longer to get there because they're learning. But ultimately, then I go away. And so he liked that. <laughs> you know, but I mean... Nobody yeah, we got to work ourselves out of a job. That is the like work that's... ourselves out of a job. Absolutely. I mean, that's that is everyone's job, including internal people. 
Um, yes. And so, you know, so, and then aspire to something else, you know, when, once you work yourself out of the job, but, but he likes that for internal people. I think it's also important for them to constantly be lobbying and advocating for, we are developing people. So we don't have to keep doing these five day Kaizen events or four day Kaizen events. Yes. So they'll, we'll just be so cross-functionally wired that, and we will be so good at surfacing problems that we'll just be able to start solving problems cross-functionally. And that'll be how we operate. It will be our way. And, um, and so, you know, I think you can just use the same, logic you know whether internal or external mm. to get people to see the value in the people side of the people development side of, of things businesses yeah. can get results without people I mean, yeah absolutely they don't just fall out of the sky so um you might as well train them to do good work and, yeah. and develop them and and yeah and, and absolutely and you want we need people at all levels to be capable and confident of solving problems at the right level and doing it while doing the work, right? And like, so uh, making improvements, developing people while we do the work. And there will always be times where we have to pull, like come off to, ha you know, whether or not you call it a Kaizen event or it's just a focused, you know, focused brain power on working on a problem or initiative. But the goal is ultimately having that be truly leader led where you don't have to have this whole cadre of external or internal p or external people coming in to do it. Right. They have the capability. Maybe there's a few a few people sort of leading the charge and the thinking to keep the continuity there. Um, but yeah, that transfer of knowledge, which is where we started off on the purpose of change leaders, is about creating the capabilities yes. across the organization for solving problems, for aligning on strategy, for leading and teaching as well. So both understanding the technical side and, and that social side too. Right. It's so critical. Uh, Karen, you started uh, the TKMG Academy a few years ago. And what are some of the observations you have about the, the topics that people are really interested in in, in filling their skill set um, and, and any, I guess, observations you have too that would be helpful, they'd be interesting for our audience here. Yeah. So one of the things that I did not see coming was how I call it juicy, like when there's lots and lots of fodder in, in things to learn. Um, I didn't realize it was going to be so juicy because we have so many organizations that are using our services. When we were, you know, when I was only consulting, you know, we might have six big clients a year because most of our engagements are longer. And so we'd get, I get six data points about what they're doing internally and how it's working. And yes, I did it for a long time. So I got six times blah, 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 years that I, that I was doing only consulting, but now I've got hundreds soon to be thousands, you know, of people that we're talking with. And we do a lot of, of um, gratis coaching. We do paid coaching as well, but we do a lot of gratis coaching just to help them understand what we offer and how to help them, achieve whatever it is that they want to do. So getting a lot of data points. And one of the things that I you know, still see a lot of is organizations not valuing developing people, not wanting to spend the budget on it, not wanting to you know, invest in people. And that's heartbreaking. But those that are taking it seriously are getting tremendous results. And by taking it seriously, it isn't just, you know, offering a library of courses to people and then let them be self-directed learners. Because, you know, the reality is a lot of people are not self-directed learners. But when you direct people to learn in a way that's tied to real world needs and real world work, and they're able to get the cognitive development and then go and apply, I mean, that's just, you know, magic. Um, in, in terms of building capabilities. So I love, you know, those are the clients that are really fun to work with because you see all this tremendous growth happening and uh, the results speak for themselves. So um, I, love, I love that part of it. I, I, you know, when I hear an organization saying, yeah, no, you know, we don't, we don't really do much in terms of training or developing our people, then, you know, I just... Yeah. Well, how likely are they going to get the results that they need on a sustained right. way? They're not focusing on developing their people right. to get results. Yeah. Uh, you know what someone told me once, a really wise, lean old geezer that um, is long, long retired now. He said, you know, Karen, there's a reason why dinosaurs don't exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because they, they became extinct because they weren't able to adapt. So, <laughs> yes, we all have to. 
we personally have to grow and adapt and be these lifelong learners. And then how do we grow that chain of learning across our organizations so that we have innovation and continuous improvement to stay ahead of the time and, and thrive? I mean, that's what that's what we all want and need. Uh, yeah. And you know, one, one last thing that that just sparked for me, there's nothing more exciting than seeing a light bulb go oh, on, you know, it's just like, oh, you know, when someone gets it and, and they're, and they get excited. I mean, I don't know anyone that finds learning of something that they're interested in a downer. Hmm. Like, I don't want to learn. <laughs> so no, well, I see that, sometimes you know? people haven't I, been given the space or yeah. the opportunity to learn or contribute. I have to say that is what got me so excited and fired up when I first switched uh, roles into moving into a more of a continuous improvement facilitator role leading the first, it was first leading those Kaizen events, but then it morphed more like just the direct coaching or helping, helping people see things like just even the workshops I'm leading for clients right now to help, you know, understand those leadership capabilities and like eyeballs lighting up. They're like, Oh, I understand that. I'm going to be so much more effective. It's these small, yeah. it can be small changes that we make, but, uh, or, yeah. or the big transformational things too, but it, it gets me excited. That's where my passion yeah. comes from as well. And, you know, healing people's day-to-day -day existence in a, mm. in a positive way. So that our leader standard, back to your question, our leader standard work, uh, leader standard work course is the number one seller. Mm. And I get the most feedback from people, maybe because it's the, the biggest seller, but um, it's the, the emotion that you hear from leaders saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much for helping me see what was wrong with my daily life and what I can be doing and should be doing that's more supportive of the team and how that helps us get results. And like they, that, that excitement, that, that buzz, like, you know, it's just, it, it's addictive, <laughs> that buzz of seeing people get excited. Yes. And that is our purpose yeah. truly as leaders and as change leaders going back to where we started, right? It's about creating that spark and that capability to learn and contribute um, and move us. Our expertise becomes how to do that mm -hmm. um, and how to pass on that knowledge and that skills. And so it's not just moving from the doing the improvement work itself, but creating that passion and the capability for everyone to do that improvement work. Yeah. We're spreading joy, you know? Oh, Yes. And, yeah. Like and spreading joy while getting results. I mean, wow, what, results. what could be, be <laughs> what could be yeah. better? Well, thank you, Karen Martin, for being here today on Chain of Learning. It, we have so much more we can talk about. I'd love for you to come back um, in the future. How can listeners get in touch with you or learn more about TKMG Academy or other work that you do? So TKMG, it used to be the Karen Martin group. That yes. Happens, that sometimes helps people go, what TK, the Karen Martin group, TKMGacademy.com. Um, there uh, also the consulting side is TKMG.com. Um, so that's probably the easiest. And LinkedIn, I'm Karen Martin Opex. And we also have both, both companies have a LinkedIn page as well. So okay. that's probably the best. I, I'm not doing X so much anymore. I left, yeah. left Facebook a while ago. I'm not. I'm still on there, but I, I'm not doing much. So, yeah. and I've Me never been a TikTok or or Insta person. So, <laughs> <laughs> me too. Well, we'll put all the links uh, for yeah. for uh, that Karen just mentioned in the show notes, and uh, be sure to go to the episode full page because we'll have additional resources there as well. So, thank you, Karen, for joining me here on Chain of Learning. It was just wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Chain of Learning with me, Katie Anderson, and my guest, Karen Martin. Be sure to go to the episode webpage, chainoflearning.com slash 11, so that you can get all the details uh, and links that Karen and I mentioned here today. And be sure to subscribe to Chain of Learning on YouTube if you're watching this video and on your favorite podcast players, such as Apple Podcasts and Spotify, so that you can be able to listen to every episode that comes out and you don't miss one. And be sure to share this with your colleagues and friends so that we can strengthen our chain of learning together. Thanks so much for tuning in and see you next time. Bye.